Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the class. I um, I've just uh, started the recording, so uh, we've got that going. Let's um, I'll just pray together, and then we will get started. Thank you for connecting to the class uh, early and uh, well in time, so we can get started. Could I please uh, ask somebody? to uh, just pray and then we will get started who would like to pray today somebody Aaron would you like to pray yeah sure pastor sure uh, Lord thank you for this new day again Lord, as we um joining with the book of Romans, Lord, uh, like the early days, Lord, fill us with your spirit, help us to be holy and righteous, Lord. As we journey with this book, uh, help us, Lord, to serve to serve you with uh with, with uh, serve you with uh with spirit and truth, Lord. And Lord, Lord, uh, let your spirit uh, manifest in our lives, so that, Lord. Lord, we will serve you with, with, with spirit and truth. So, Lord, fill us more each and every single day. So, I submit the rest of the time into your loving hand. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, good morning, everyone, once again. All right. So, last week, we, um, we um, gave a little introduction to the book of Paul's epistle to the Romans. Uh, we gave um, a little bit of background, a little, his, a little bit of history, uh, how we know when this book was written, from where it was written, what were the reasons behind uh, Paul's writing, and so on. Just a little background. And then we got started with chapter one. And um, what I would like us to do is um, um, just read through right from the start of the chapter, just read through. Uh, we've already read, um, we, I think we covered till about verse 9, 10, somewhere we were there and looking at it. But um, let's just read through verses 1 through 12, and then we will pick up from verse 9 and move forward from there. But just a little, you know, get the context together. Somebody could read for us R Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Just read uh, all 12 verses and then. Uh, we will pick up from verse 9 and move forward. Could somebody just read that for us, please? Sure, Pastor. Can I go ahead? Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 1 to 12, reading from the NIV version. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who has to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to be to, to belong to Jesus Christ, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the, the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Amen. Thank you. So 
you know, we, we've commented on um, uh, eight, nine verses. We were somewhere, it was uh, nine, 10, 11. So we're going to pick up from there um, just to, um, to remind us of some of the things we highlighted there from verse nine. Uh, Paul was saying, you know, uh, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit or in my spirit or with my heart. Though all my heart, like we read it from, heard from the NIV, I serve with my spirit. So one of the things we said there is really the ministry, the serving, serving God is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the spirit. That's, we have to emphasize or focus on that first. Uh, and then, you know, okay, the outside, the, the methods and the mannerisms and all of those other things come later. Uh, but most importantly, we serve God in the spirit. Uh, we saw how Paul was uh, praying for these believers and he was giving thanks to God for them. And uh, he was, um, for their faith, you know, how their faith has been spoken of. Of course, they were in Rome. Uh, so Rome was the capital of the, the Roman Empire. So things that happened there would easily spread you know, throughout the empire. And so news of believers in Jerusalem uh, was spreading. So, hey, so, you know, you can imagine that. And obviously, it's a good, good news or good report about them. So you can imagine that people in different parts of the empire, the Roman Empire, are speaking about what the believers in Rome, uh, good things about them. And so Paul is grateful, is thankful that their faith is being spoken of in many other places. And uh, he's praying for them. And he says, you know, I'm praying that I will be able to come to you. You know, the opportunity come to you. Then he came to verse 11. And why does he want to go there? Right? Why does he want to come to them? So remember that uh, by this time, by this time, Paul is writing around 57 AD from Corinth. Uh, the day of Pentecost, approximately AD 30. So we have about 27 years have elapsed. Uh, what we said is, um, you know, uh, the church in Rome most likely happened because there were Jews from Rome who came to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Their lives were impacted, and then eventually they went back to Rome. So it's about seven years since those early believers. Of course, new people would have, new believers would have come into the church. But what I want to uh, impress here is that uh, this is not a, you know, a two-year-old congregation. Uh, this is a church that has been there for a good amount of time, you know, maybe at least or approximately uh, 30 years. But to them, he is saying, I want to come and impart to you some spiritual gift, right? Some gift. From grace. So this is, you know, uh, you know uh, I just want to just remind you that these notes have been put up in the uh, coursework section. So I hope you've downloaded it so that you could review uh, review these things after class or you know whenever uh, you have uh, uh, time. So uh, Paul uh, is saying, you know, I've I want to come and I want to impart to you uh, some spiritual gift. So he's, he's there desiring to impart. Some, some things we can deduce from here, that spiritual things can be imparted. So there is impartation, and then there is training. Right? Some things are taught, and some things are caught. You know, just people use that phrase. Um, so here Paul is talking about being, uh, you know, coming to them and wanting to impart, give to them something, right? So uh, spiritual gifts can be imparted. It means somebody has something and they can pass it on to others. Now, of course, 
this impartation can take place through so many uh, ways. One important way you have spiritually is shared with somebody else spiritually is through teaching, right? So you share, you speak about it, you talk about it, you teach about it. And so through the process of teaching and communicating the truth, there is an impartation of the gift. Spiritual gifts can also be imparted through association, right? So uh, as people are together in fellowship, they're relating to each other. What happens? Things pass from one person to the other person or to the other group of people who are in relationship, fellowship, in, in association. So uh, understand that you know spiritual things can be imparted. And, and if you look at the Greek there, it's really uh, the same word that's used to uh, for in part is uh, uh, it's used to share you know like if uh, a man has two coats you give one to the other so you've got something you give it away uh, to somebody else who's in need and um, the outcome is verse 12 that there will be mutual encouragement Paul says you know I also will be encouraged um, by our faith the mutual faith right? so Paul is desiring to impart to them. You know, he knows I can carry something I can give to you. And uh, as ministers of God, uh, that's part of what we want to do. We want to impart to people, right? So you know what you carry. You know the grace. You know the truth, the word of God. You know you're carrying something and you want to give to somebody. Uh, Paul is being intentional about it, right? He's saying, I'm coming, I want to come, and I want to impart. That means he's aware of this. He is intentional about it, and he's uh, desiring to do it. I want to give, right? So impartation from our side as ministers of God uh, is an intentional thing. You, you, you get filled up with God, with his word, uh, with his presence, and then you say, I want to go and give to people. I want to impart that. Right? So we can be intentional, just like Paul was, uh, to impart, to pass on spiritual things to people. Um, now we pick up from verse 13 and go down through verse 17. Let's pick up, uh, can we read that please? Verse 13 to 17, somebody could read that. I'll read, Pastor. Go ahead, Thomas. Now I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am adapted both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to wise and un un unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it written, the just shall live by faith. Mm. Thank you. So, verse 13, second time, Paul is... Uh, telling the believers about his intent to come. Right? He, did, he mentioned that in verse 10 earlier, that, look, I've been praying, I've been asking, seeking God, I want to come. He's repeating that, you know, he says, brothers, uh, I, I, you know, I want to tell you the fact, look, I really have been wanting to come to you for quite some time. But you know, various things have kept me away, hindered or stopped me from coming. Uh, could be his own uh, uh, busyness uh, in uh, his own busyness in in the ministry or you know other things that he was going through. Uh, so he decided to go there. He was uh, designed to go there. I just want to point out a few things there. You know, um, in the ministry, uh, We, we need to, you know, we need to, uh, okay, let me speak in like this. In the ministry, you know, we have a desire to do many things, right? 
uh, and uh, we know, you know, from even from our case of Apostle Paul, I'm sure he had a desire to serve many people. And uh, by this time, he had already finished, or he was close to the end of three missionary journeys, uh, which means he has already planted uh, many churches. Probably traveled to you know close to 50 cities by that time. It was the end of his third missionary journey, uh, which means uh, he's got things happening in so many different places, uh, not to mention the smaller towns and villages he may have visited along his journeys. Uh, and I'm sure inside his heart that there would be this desire to go to many places. You know, he cared for the believers at Rome, which he's expressing here. I'm sure he cared for, you know, believers at Corinth, at Philippi, at, you know, in so many places. He, his heart was like, I, he, I wish he could be in 50 different places at the same time to go and minister to them. Uh, and yet, you know, what do we do? And I'm sure we also would have that same desire. God, I wish I could do this for them, for them, for them, for them. Uh, one important thing, Paul uh, discloses in Second Corinthians chapter one, and uh, it's just, just a little side journey, you know. Um, in Second Corinthians chapter one, he writes to the same, uh, you know, to the Corinthians, and he says. Um, uh, uh, in verse 17, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 17, uh, once again, like he's writing to the Corinthians, expressing a similar desire, and I want to come to you by way of Macedonia, I want to visit you, and so on. But then in verse 17, he says, could somebody read that for us, please? 2 Corinthians 1, verse 17. Keep your hand in Romans 1, we'll come back. Yes, sir. Therefore, when I was planting this, planning this, did I do it lightly? All the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me? There should be yes, yes, and no, no. Mm. So, Paul is uh, asking a question here. Let me see, there's some alert here. Okay, no problem. So Paul is, you know, to, to the Corinthians, he's saying, look, I really was planning to come to you. And then he says, you know, the things I plan, do I plan it according to the flesh? So he's asking the question. The answer is giving us the insight that Paul is driving. The answer, obviously, you know, you're not planning according to the flesh, you're planning according to the spirit right so uh, even in his plans we can be sure the things that paul was planning and is going to visit different churches and you know people that he was ministering to are responsible for he was not planning according to the flesh <coughs> sorry but he's depending on the holy spirit so going back to romans 1 13 you know, even as Paul is saying, look, you know, I was very desirous that I should come to you. And of course, there are practical things that kept him away. There's also this whole element or aspect of spirit. And that's something we also should learn uh, in the ministry that we plan according to the spirit, you know, who to go to when to minister to them, and so on. Um, if you if we study what happened to Paul, so Paul is writing this from Corinth around AD 57, and you, you know, subsequently, the notes as well, it happened in Jerusalem, as soon as he goes to Jerusalem over there, he's apprehended by the Jews, he's arrested, and then they hold him in Caesarea for two years, waiting for trial. And he appears before, you know, three different leaders, kings, um, Felix and Festus and Agrippa. He appears before them. And eventually he ap appeals to Caesar. So they say, okay, you, have, you have appealed to Caesar, then you've got to go to Rome. So they send him, you know, with an escort of soldiers along with others. 
uh, by ship from Caesarea all the way traveling to Rome, and that takes about about a year. I mean, uh, you know, by the time they eventually reach, there's you know they have shipwreck and other things on the way. Uh, so by the time he reaches Rome, uh, it's about three years. So from the time of this writing, and it has not been a very comfortable journey. Uh, it has been in situ circumstances by which he reaches Rome. Uh, so on one hand, his, you know, his desire to be with the believers in Rome is being fulfilled. He gets there, but how he arrives there is a very difficult journey. Um, I don't want to read too much into it because it is, you know, a life experience. Um, and, but uh, what we can take away is, you know, sometimes as we are in, in the ministry, as we're serving God, uh, there are desires in our heart and, uh, you know, how we, God will get us there. But how we get there may be through ways we really didn't expect or necessarily uh, un, you know, uh, anticipated. Right? When God eventually got, Paul was there in Rome and he spent two years in Rome while waiting to come before Caesar. Uh, he was under what we would call as house arrest, uh, meaning it wasn't in a prison cell, but he was able to have his own home and, meet with people there and uh, and uh, so he was actually able to I'm sure that you know the, the believers in Rome came and he ministered to them and so on so he got that this thing this desire fulfilled but it just took place in some unexpected uh, in, in an unexpected manner okay just to keep that in mind I, I don't want to build a theology around it but you know um, there this is what happened now Verse 14 and 15, uh, verse 14, Paul says, I am a debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. He says, I am a debtor. Now, that means I owe something to these people. Now, what did he mean by that? You know, how, how can we understand this? I owe these people something. I owe them something. The Greeks, the barbarians, meaning look at it. Uh, Paul, little cross-reference, we go to Galatians chapter 2. Uh, there are several verses on this, but Let's just look at 1 Galatians 2 and uh, verse 8, please. Yeah. Uh, what's Galatians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Somebody could read that for us. Galatians 2, 8 and 9. Sure. Um, for God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. Verse 9. Okay. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. Hmm. Okay. So, very, very interesting. Paul was a Jew and the Lord made him an apostle to the Gentiles. Peter, James and John were Jews. The Lord made them apostle to the Jews. Now, so they knew their you know, so you, so you see how God appoints us to serve certain people. And in Paul's case, he was appointed as an apostle to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles, 
at least in the, in those days, in that context, immediately, the major part of the Gentiles were the Greeks. And the Greeks were everywhere. The Greeks were in power, right? The Greeks. Uh, uh, and, and barbarians. getting a message here that my connection was interrupted. So in case you lost me, let me just repeat that. So Paul is saying, you know, so we see Apollos, an apostle to the Gentiles. The Gentiles, broadly speaking, are the Greeks who are the intellectuals. The highly, you know, the, the uh, people who think, who reason. And then there are the barbarians, meaning there's a gen genetic word for, you know, people who may not be uh, highly educated and so on. But Paul says, I am a debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise, that is, once again, the Greeks and the unwise, meaning not very scholarly, not very educated, the barbarians. But why is Paul saying, I am a debtor? Because he was appointed by the Lord, which we just read in Galatians 2, 8 and 9, as an apostle to the Greeks and the barbarians, to the Gentiles. So Paul is saying, I am a debtor to them. So here's a thought I want us to keep in mind. The call of God makes us indebted to assigned. That means we owe them something. Why do you owe them something? Because God has appointed you for them. And you've got to go and fulfill the call to serve them. And the only way you can pay that debt, so to speak, is by you going and serving. Because that's the call of God. The call of God makes us indebted to the people God has assigned us to. And that's what Paul is expressing here. He says, I am a debtor to the Gentiles, the Greeks and the barbarians, whether they're educated or uneducated, they're Gentiles. I am a debtor to them because the Lord made me an apostle to them. Send me to them. I owe them something. And that's why he's writing to the Believers in Rome, he says, you know, I'm a debtor. In fact, I owe you something. I feel I owe you something. So I need to come and, you know, in some way pay this debt. And that's why he says in verse 15, so as much as it may is, I'm ready to come to you who are in Rome because I, I owe something to the Gentiles, to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and wise. I owe something. So I want to come to you and preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. And so, you know, there's that sense of indebtedness uh, that the call of God places on our hearts. And sometimes you may feel it. Even in the gospel, and you know, the gospel again is a major theme, like you said last week. Uh, um, all right. Uh, am I back now? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Pastor. No, it's back. We just lost you for a moment there. Sorry. Uh, the last part. Oh, okay. okay. Couldn't hear anything. Oh, okay. I just realized that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Paul, uh, so he says, you know, I, I'm ready to come and uh, preach uh, the uh, the gospel. To you who are in Rome, to the Gentiles, you know, I'm ready to come. And uh, I was just highlighting the gospel. Uh, we saw that the gospel 
uh, is a major theme here, right? He starts off by saying it's the gospel of uh, the, the Son of God, right? Uh, the gospel of God. And so he says, I'm bringing that good news. I want to proclaim the gospel. Uh, that doesn't mean he wants to get them saved again. No, they are saved, but the gospel is not only the message of salvation, but it is the message of the kingdom. Everything about the kingdom has to do with the gospel. And uh, when we see what actually happened uh, when Paul got to Rome, uh, if you go with me to Acts 28, if you just turn one or two pages in your Bible, uh, Acts 28, and you look at verse 30 and 20, 31. Can somebody read that, please? Acts 28, 30 and 31. Acts 28, 30 and 31. Mm -hmm. And Paul dwelt two, year, two whole years in his own hired house and received all that uh, came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those, these things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Okay, thank you. So verse 13, 31, I'm just telling us what Paul did at Rome. So he had said in Romans 1, I want to come and bring the gospel to you who are in Rome. Acts 28, 13, 31. He is in Rome. Uh, he's in his own rented house for two years. What is he doing? He is teaching them about the kingdom of God and about the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what he was wanting to pour out into them. Right? And that's what he's getting to do right there. He's teaching them. He says, I want to bring you the gospel. What's the gospel? It's not just, you know, the message of salvation, but the good news of the Son of God is about the kingdom of God. And it's about the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is and all he came to do for us and all that God has given to us in the person of Christ. And so for two years, he was there teaching them these things. Verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the message of Christ. This message is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Powerful statement. You and I must not be ashamed of the message of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not be ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because everything we preach and teach about Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, it is the power of God for salvation. Power of God for salvation. So think about this. The message is the power of God for salvation. What we preach and teach is really administering God's power into people's lives, that will result in salvation. Now, understand that in the New Testament, the word salvation is a comprehensive word. Um, it includes forgiveness from sin and everything else, healing, deliverance, uh, preservation of life, uh, uh, you know, safety and victory and triumph over enemies. All of that is in, in that word, salvation. It's a comprehensive word. Everything that delivers us from sin and Satan is included in that word. Sin, sickness, and Satan is included in that word. So the message is the power of God. It brings God's power for salvation. And so Paul says, I'm not ashamed because I know when I talk about Jesus, when I talk about his kingdom, the power of God is being made available for people to be saved people to be delivered, for people to be, uh, you know, for, for the salvation of God to take place in their lives. And he says to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Yeah. Verse 17 is a very, very important verse. This verse gave birth to what we refer to today as the Reformation or the Protestant movement. Martin Luther uh, and everything he did, he drew inspiration from Romans 1 verse 17. 
Right? So Romans 1.17 is actually a monumental verse as far as the Protestant movement, uh, you know, we call it the Protestant movement, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a monumental verse for the Protestant faith. He sa it says here, for in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So in the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed. The fact that God is righteous and just from faith to faith. That means throughout, you know, the uh, gener generations of faith, of, of people of faith, that God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. And he says, the just, and he's quoting from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. He says, the just shall So, God being righteous, because God is a God who's righteous. Uh, uh, the word righteous, so, so in the New Testament, the word righteous and just, or righteousness, justification. They both come from the same Greek word. So they're actually synonymous, can be used. Righteous, just, righteousness, justification. Right? Uh, so the righteousness of God, the fact that God is right, that God is blameless, the righteousness of God is revealed, is unveiled from faith to faith as we journey through faith to faith. So as in the gospel, we see that God is righteous. We see that that righteousness is imparted to people of faith. And that is how we become just how we become righteous. And he calls us, therefore, to live by faith. So this is what triggered Martin Luther's thinking when he read this verse. He said, hey, the gospel, which is a message of grace, the gospel is unveiling God's righteousness and that righteousness is given to people who have faith. He's not calling us to uh, do works. And that righteousness is given to people of faith, those who have faith. And then he's just calling us to live by faith, the just. Now, how does a man become just? is because the righteousness of God is given to the man through the gospel. So he's become just. And he's going to live by faith, not by, you know, and in those times, um, the church was so steeped in tradition and uh, they had all kinds of uh, rituals and you know, all kinds of things happening. And so Martin Luther realizes that's not it. The gospel makes provision for the righteousness of God to be given to man, the just. And then what God calls us is to live by faith. And that's what prompted him to say, hey, we need to stop doing all these things and live by faith because we are justified by faith and we live thereafter, we live by faith. So this Romans 1.17 as Martin Luther, you know, pondered through on it and as revelation to him, through Romans 1.17, he understood it. In the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed. God's righteousness is imparted to the man who has faith. That man is declared to be just. And thereafter, that man is going to live by faith. He's going to walk by faith. So, it's grace, righteousness, and faith. There is no aspect of being, you know, buying my 
buying my forgiveness through any other means. No, it's all grace, righteousness, and faith. Romans 1.17, very, very important scripture. So having, you know, having introduced, so you, you could consider like verses 1 through 17 as, you know, Paul's the general introduction. And now from verse 18, he gets down to some serious things. He starts talking about God, God's wrath, and then the proof of God's existence. And how man has denied the existence of God or denies the existence of God and therefore continues on in sin. But then there is the judgment for sin. Okay. So let's read Romans 18. And we will read verse 1 to 23, please. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 23. Sorry. Romans 1, 18 to 23. Somebody could read it. Any questions so far? You're following with me now? Uh, have been following with me so far? Yes, Pastor. So, uh, I mean, if I may just uh, recap Go ahead. verse 17. Um, I mean, if I've understood it correctly. So, uh, we see that God's righteousness is revealed in his gospel. And uh, and and through the word uh, we are made righteous uh, by faith, and which empowers us to live by faith, um, and we and we don't live uh, live by deeds. We don't believe we put, we don't put our faith in deeds or our actions that makes us righteous. Is that correct, Pastor? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. 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 Right. So when Martin Pastor, Luther under, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Pastor. Um, so another thing is, uh, so, I mean, in Acts, uh, I think 22 or somewhere, um, we read that uh, Paul is a citizen of Rome. Uh, is that correct, Pastor? That, yes. And, uh, yes. So the only reason that he it took time for him to get to Rome was not necessarily... Um, I mean, he could have gotten there early, but then it's just that he, uh, like we read in verse 14 and he had the heart for other nations other people surrounding nations also that um that is the only reason why uh it delayed him to getting to rome uh, three like you said three years it took him three years right yeah that was one okay. and also uh i mean one is he was busy with the ministry already he was you know he was on his third missionary journey in that region uh but the second one was when he was arrested in Jerusalem, so what happened from Corinth, where he was writing this letter, he travels back to Jerusalem to, you know, deliver the collections, the offerings uh, to the saints in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, he's there. And there in Jerusalem, he is arrested by the Jews. And uh, then they actually keep him arrested for two years in Caesarea. Uh, uh, because, you know, um, uh, the different leaders were sent kind of, uh, I don't know what's the right word to use, but they were sending Paul, you know, across to each other. So there was um, Festus, Felix, and Agrippa who, you know, were, saying, okay, you decide, you decide, you decide what, you know. So he was kind of uh, held up there in Caesarea because they had accused him of, creating a riot and causing problems. Um, and finally, Paul says, hey, I'm, I'm appealing to Caesar, you know. Uh, so then they send him, okay, they send him to Caesar. So that kind of uh, is why he was delayed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, I, I just saw the, some highlights in Acts from 23, I think. Uh, it's, mm. It mentions the same thing that you just said. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah. So, Kiran just wants us to repeat uh, verse 17. So, Paul says, in it, that is in the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed. So, the righteousness of God, the fact that God is right, that's one aspect of righteousness, but that he also gives that righteousness to people. The righteousness of God is revealed. 
how is it revealed or how is it uh, given? God gives that righteousness to people who have faith. And one, and that's what makes us just. So, for example, that latter part was the just shall live by faith. You can also we can also translate it: the righteous will live by faith. It's the same root word. So, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God has been revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written: the righteous shall live by faith. So, the gospel through grace makes the righteousness of God available to those who have faith. And these people who have been made righteous, just, live by faith. Okay? So basically he's saying, hey, righteousness, which is made available through the gospel by grace, is received by faith. And those who receive that righteousness, they will have to live by, they continue to live by faith. So the deeds doesn't earn us the righteousness. It is only an expression that God has made us right and we are in right relationship with God. And therefore we do the works, we do the deeds um, that God wants us to do. Okay. So Paul now gets into, uh, you know, talking about God. And now, you know, this is now he's getting into the teaching part of Romans, right? And he starts with the very basics. He starts with God, sin, creation, existence of God, and, uh, you know, what has happened, what, how man is responding to that, okay? So Romans 1, 18 to 23, somebody can read that passage. Then we'll go for a break. Yeah. Yeah, anyone can read it. Go ahead, go ahead. Romans 1 verse 18 onwards. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who sup suppresses the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. Mm. Right. So... I mean, this passage is, is, is very powerful. So Paul is saying, hey, God is not just ignoring the sins that are going on. Right? He says, the wrath of God. Now, it's God is angry. God is opposed to all the sin and the wickedness that's going on. But how did man end up like that? He says, you see, men have suppressed the truth. Instead of acknowledging the truth. And he says, verse 19, God has made it plain. God has revealed things to us. And what does he point to? Verse 20, he points to creation. He says, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen in the things that are made. So he's pointing to creation. And he says, you know what? We have no excuse. Because look at creation, look at everything around us. And he's saying, 
the attributes of God are actually put on display in creation. So, you know, many of us are saying, well, if God reveals himself to me, I'll believe that he is there. What Paul is saying is, hey, God is staring you in the face through his creation. Because the invisible attributes of God are being revealed to us in the things he made in his creation. So, for example, God is infinite. That's an invisible attribute. The universe, or now, nowadays they use the term metaverse because it's like many universes. And we don't know if there could be other universes other than us, you know, beyond us. We don't know how big, how great. It's infinite for us. So the infiniteness of God, the infinite attribute of God, is seen right there. How many stars are there? It's like billions. We don't know. It's, it's just billions. It's just that many. Have we, have we counted all the stars? No. We just know they're just infinite number almost. Yeah, I mean, we don't know just that many. So the infinite attribute of God is revealed in his creation. The creation is infinite. So like that, there are other attributes of God seen in his creation, is what Paul is saying. Okay, So let's pause here for a, a quick break. We'll take our 10 minute break and uh, come back and continue from here. Uh, feel free to, you know, uh, bring up your questions as we go 